In this video, I will discuss the occipital bone in detail. Occipital bone is an unpaired and posterior most of all the bones in the skull. This green is the occipital bone. This is the isolated occipital bone. And as you can see, this is a curved bone. Also, there is a large foramen in the occipital bone called the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum divide the occipital bone into four parts. The part interior to the foramen magnum is called the basilar part. The part posterior to the foramen magnum is called the squamous part. And it is called squamous because it really is smooth in nature. The third and the fourth part are present on either side of the foramen magnum. And they are called the condylar parts. And they are called the condylar parts because the main structure that are present in that region is the condyles. We will begin with the squamous part of the occipital bone. The squamous part has two surfaces, four borders and three angles. We will begin with the surfaces. The two surfaces are the internal surface which is concave in nature and the second surface is the external surface which is convex in nature. First, I will discuss the external surface. As I told you, it is convex in shape. In the center of the external surface, there is present a protuberance called external occipital protuberance. The highest point of the external occipital protuberance is called the inion. The inion is present in the midline of the body. From the inion, Two arc lines run from medial side to the lateral side and these are called the superior nuclear line. Two other lines run superior to the superior nuclear line. These are faint and sometimes difficult to observe and are called the highest nuclear line. A thick bony ridge extends from the inion to the posterior margin of foramen magnum in the midline and it is called the external occipital crust. From the midway of the external occipital crust, two lines run from medial to lateral side and these are called the inferior nuclear lines. So a total of three nuclear lines are present on the external surface of the occipital bone. The superior nuclear line, the highest nuclear line and the inferior nuclear line. The superior nuclear line divide the external surface into two parts. The area above to it is called the planum occipital, while the area below to it is called planum nucale. Also, the superior nuclear line is the border between the scalp and the neck. Let me show you in this view. This is where the superior nuclear line is present. Above this is the scalp and below this is the neck region. Now we came to the internal surface of the squamous part. The internal surface is concave in nature. In this model, the landmarks of the internal surface is not clear. So we will move to a different model. Just like the external surface, the internal surface also has a protuberance called the internal occipital protuberance. Now before going into further discussion, we must understand the difference between the sulcus and the sinus. The sulcus basically mean the depression or grooves and these could be anywhere such as in the brain, in the heart and also on the bones while the sinuses are the venous channels. In this model, all these blue channels that you see are the sinuses. For example, this highlighted blue is the superior sagittal sinus. Now if I remove all these sinuses, then you can clearly see that these sinuses has created depression on the bones. And these depressions are called the sulci or singular sulcus. Now the internal occipital protuberance is the meeting point of four sulci. One sulcus from above two on either sides and one from the below. The upper sulcus is called the 
sigital sulcus and the sigital sulcus is continuous with the right transverse sulcus because in the sigital sulcus is present the superior sigital sinus and it is continuous with the right transverse sinus on the two sides of the internal occipital protuberance are present transverse sulci that is the right transverse sulcus and the left transverse sulcus and in the right and left transverse sulci are present the right and left transverse sinuses as you can see in this diagram this is the right transverse sinus and this is the left transverse sinus and these are present in the right and left transverse sulci below from the internal occipital protuberance a crust is running downward and it is called the internal occipital crust the internal occipital crust is also a sulcus the center of it shows a depression and in that depression is present the occipital sinus as you can see in this model this is the occipital sinus present in the internal occipital crust so the internal occipital protuberance is the meeting point of four sinuses one sigital sinus from above two transverse sinuses from two sides and one occipital sinus from below so this meeting point of all the sinuses is called the confluence of sinuses now these four sulci are collectively called as the cruciform sulci around these cruciform sulci are present four fossa on the internal surface that is two fossa are present on either side of the superior sigital sulcus and two fossa are present on either side of the internal occipital crust the two fossa which are present on either side of the superior sigital sulcus is triangular in shape and lodges the occipital lobe of the brain as you can see there are present the two fossa and in these is present the occipital lobe of the brain now the two fossa which are present on either side of the internal occipital crust these are quadrilateral in shape and in these fossa is present the two cerebellar hemispheres as you can see this is one cerebellar hemisphere present in the quadrilateral shape fossa the internal occipital crust towards the posterior margin of the foramen magnum shows a triangular depression called wormian fossa now we came to the four borders of the squamous surface among them the two borders are the supralateral and the two borders are the infralateral first we will discuss the supralateral borders these are the two supralateral borders in the posterior view of the complete skull these are the two supralateral borders and they attach the occipital bone to the parietal bones via the lamboid suture these supralateral borders start at the superior angle and terminate at the lateral angle so one supralateral border starts from here and it terminate at the lateral angle at this point and of course the other supralateral border will start from here and will terminate at the lateral angle at this point next is the infralateral border the infralateral border is also two in number it start from the lateral angle over here to the jugular process over here so this is the infralateral border extending from the lateral angle above to the jugular process below now in an isolated model these are the two jugular process and this is the lateral angle this hole is the infralateral borders and this infralateral border is connecting the occipital bone to the mastoid part of the temporal bone as you can see next is the three angles among the three angles one is the superior angle and two are the lateral angles first we will discuss the superior angle in the posterior view of the isolated bone 
this is the superior angle now in complete skull model this is the superior angle and it is the meeting point of three bones that is the two parietal bones and one occipital bone also this is the meeting point of three sutures the sagittal suture and the two lamboid sutures this meeting point is also called lambda next is the lateral angle in isolated bone view these are the two lateral angles while in the posterior view of the complete skull model this is one lateral angle and this is the another lateral angle we will take one lateral angle as a representative this is the meeting point of three bones the parietal bone the occipital bone and the temporal bone and also the lateral angle is the meeting point of three sutures the lamboid suture parietomastoid suture and the occipitomastoid suture and this side is also called as the asterion next is the basilar part of the occipital bone also called as the basi occiput it extend from the interior margin of the foramen magnum and it has three surfaces and two lateral borders we will begin with the surfaces first one is the interior surface this is the interior surface second one is the superior surface this is the superior surface and third one is the inferior surface and this is the inferior surface first one is the interior surface the interior surface is attached to the posterior surface of the body of the sphenoid this is the sphenoid bone this is the posterior surface of the body of the sphenoid and over here is attached the interior surface of the basilar part of occipital bone as you can see next is the superior surface this slopy surface is the superior surface and form the posterior part of the clivus this whole slopy surface is the clivus interiorly it is contributed by the sphenoid bone and posteriorly it is contributed by the superior surface of the basilar part of occipital bone this slopy superior surface is directed downward and backward into the foramen magnum next is the inferior surface of the basilar part on the inferior surface is present a tubercle called the pharyngeal tubercle on either side of the pharyngeal tubercle there is present a small depression and this depression provide attachment to the longus capitis muscle posterior and lateral to this and in front of the occipital condyle are present two more depression and these also provide attachment to the muscles next is the two lateral borders of the basilar part these are the two lateral borders and these are attached to the posterior border of the petrous part of temporal bone as you can see in this complete skull model these two lateral borders are attached to the petrous part of the temporal bone next is the condylar part of the occipital bone on either side of the foramen magnum is present the condylar part of the occipital bone these are the two condylar parts there are two main structure present in the condylar part number 1 the occipital condyles and number 2 the jugular processes first we will discuss the condyles the condyles are situated along the interior half of the foramen magnum as you can see this is the interior half of the foramen magnum and along the interior half are present the condyles the condyles are smooth oval shape articular facet and it articulate with the superior articular facet of the first vertebra this is the interior view of the first vertebra these are the two superior articular facet that articulate with the condyles of the occipital bone this is the first vertebra articulating with the condyles of the occipital bone and together they form the atlanto occipital joint 
Now above the condyles, a foramen is present on either side and it is called the hypoglossal canal. This is one hypoglossal canal and this is the other hypoglossal canal. From the superior view, these two are the inlets of the hypoglossal canal. The hypoglossal canal passes through the occipital bone and then exact to these outlet. So these are the outlets of the hypoglossal canal. Now just above the condyle, a tubercle is present called the jugular tubercle. Next is the jugular process. These bony process projecting interiorly and laterally are the jugular processes. These jugular processes has two margin and two surfaces. First we will discuss with the margins. The jugular processes has the interior margin and the lateral margin. This is the interior margin of the jugular process. As you can see it is a notch and it form the posterior boundary of the jugular foramen. As you can see in this complete skull model, these two are the jugular foramen. We will take one jugular foramen as a representative. This jugular foramen is formed as a gap between the temporal bone and the occipital bone. So the interior margin of the jugular foramen is formed by the temporal bone while the posterior margin of the jugular foramen is formed by the interior margin of the jugular process of occipital bone. Next is the lateral margin. The lateral margin is rough articular border attached to the petrous part of the temporal bone. As you can see the lateral margin attached to the petrous part of the temporal bone. Next is the two surfaces the superior surface and the inferior surface. The inferior surface provide attachment to the muscle while the superior surface as you can see is deeply curved and form the terminal part of the sigmoid sulcus that will lead to the jugular foramen. As you can see in this model this is the sigmoid sulcus and the terminal part of the sigmoid sulcus is formed by the superior surface of the jugular process and in the sigmoid sulcus is present the sigmoid sinus that will eventually lead to the jugular foramen and once the sigmoid sinus is, is passed through the jugular foramen then it is called the internal jugular vein posterior to the condyles of the occipital bone is present a fossa called the condylar fossa and in the condylar fossa a canal is present called the condylar canal. The last part in the occipital bone is the foramen magnum. It is large oval shaped foramen. In adult the approximate diameter is 3.5 cm anterior posteriorly and 3 cm transversely. From the inferior view, the midpoint of the interior border is called basion. That's all about the occipital bone. Thank you.